Good morning, everybody, or should I say good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's a real pleasure to be talking to you this afternoon about a topic which I find very interesting, and that is tests beyond the audiogram that can influence hearing aid feature selection. Uh, we find ourselves in a time where uh, hearing aids are advancing more and more, uh, yet from a diagnostic perspective uh, and from a functional perspective, we're often not looking at exactly how the patient can hear in more complex situations and hearing aids can now deal with these situations. So we really should be taking these things into account and hopefully then using information in the diagnostic process to be choosing uh, hearing aid features. And we're gonna cover three tests today which seem to be uh, very popular at the minute in the literature. Uh, and those are the threshold equalizing noise test or the 10 test, the quick sin, which is a speech in noise test and an acceptable uh, noise level test. And we'll go for each one of those in a little bit more detail as we go through the session. And anyway, let me introduce myself. My name is Lee Martin and I am the manager of the Intraacoustics Academy. And at the Academy, we're responsible for uh, driving training and education in diagnostic technologies and their applications. And uh, we already have a host of materials on the area of advanced audiometry. Uh, Mike Maslin has done uh, a wonderful webinar last year, I believe, uh, and that covers a lot of the diagnostic content and the technical content around these uh, advanced tests, uh, in particular the 10 test. Um, but today what I want to do is I want to focus the attention on to looking at these tests and as I say really with the uh, idea of how can we use these tests to influence uh, hearing aid features. So we could ask the question why should we bother looking beyond audiometry? Everything all you need to program a hearing aid uh, in theory is an audiogram. Is there any need to do anything more? Well, if we think about audiometry, the first thing we can say is that it's very good at differentiating between conductive and sensual neural, sensory neural hearing losses. But actually, the term sensory neural hearing loss is vague, and there's been a lot of sort of development over recent years about certain sites causing sensory neural hearing loss and having different effects. I've tried to simplify this today and just break down sensory neural hearing loss into sort of three sites of. Uh, uh, origin and that's the outer hair cells, the inner hair cells and uh, a neural loss. And if we think about the outer hair cells, uh, these of course which is typically the assumption which people think is the main uh, cause of a sensory neural hearing loss and we know that these are responsible for the amplification of the signal uh, and uh, a loss of these outer hair cells results in an increased hearing threshold. And of course, this is what hearing aids are designed to overcome. The inner hair cells, however, these could also be damaged. And of course, the inner hair cells is responsible for transducing that signal uh, from the traveling wave into an electrical signal. And uh, we know now that inner hair cells actually cause distortion. So depending on the site of lesion uh, in the cochlea, you're going to have two different clinical symptoms which the patient's going to be experiencing. And if we don't take that into account in the hearing aid fitting or choosing hearing aid features, then we might be missing a trick. Lastly, of course, we have the nerve and its main job is to carry the signal to the cortex. And of course, we know that with neural losses, we get both increased thresholds and distortion. So we have certain sites causing certain clinical patterns. And as I say, we should just be aware or try and at least uh, get a bit more certainty on where the hearing loss lies before actually making any decision on amplification and hearing aid uh, features. Despite the fact that we have these different sites of lesion uh, with regard to sensory neural hearing loss, we still find uh, that audiometry is still by far uh, and in many places the only test which is uh, performed before fitting a hearing aid. Of course there's also speech audiometry um, but I have had a, a fortunate experience in my job to travel in many different countries and I often see that uh, audiometry is still really the only test uh, which is being used to influence uh, amplification choice.
it's been demonstrated that uh, audiometry uh, cannot differentiate between outer hair cell and inner hair cell loss, hence the term uh, we just have century neural uh, hearing loss. If we was going to therefore uh, fit everybody the same regardless if they had an inner hair cell loss or an outer hair cell loss, uh, then it wouldn't really be a problem if audiometry uh, couldn't differentiate between the two. But we do know that audiometry is a, a poor predictor of speech intelligibility. Uh, so therefore, it means that these sensory neural hearing losses are being caused in different areas. And therefore, uh, we don't know how much speech intelligibility we're going to be getting with these patients. And as a consequence, then we may be choosing the wrong approach to fitting our hearing aids. So what can we do to improve our uh, amplification choices and hearing aid fitting uh, feature selection? Well, as I mentioned, there's three tests which are popular in the literature at the minute. The threshold equalizing noise test, the quick sin test, and the acceptable noise level test. And really what you can do is you can use these tests to look at different hearing aid uh, features. So the threshold equalizing noise test we can use to look at both the bandwidth of the hearing aid, but also the frequency compression technique which you want to be uh, using or if you want to be using frequency compression at all. Quicksyn are typically uh, centered around looking at signal enhancing technology. So based on the person's Quicksyn score, we can then make a choice of whether or not they need directional microphones or FM systems or something along the lines of that. And then lastly, we have the acceptable noise level test. And uh, what we're looking for here is, OK, well, when we choose a hearing aid, what type of noise reduction algorithms does it have? Do we need to have noise reduction? Do we need to have it set aggressively? Do we need to have it set mildly? And the acceptable noise level test can give us some insights into uh, how to set that up. So let's start with each of these tests and we'll run through them and then have a look at the, uh, the implications of their, uh, their results afterwards. So with the threshold equalizing noise tests, what you can see on this slide is that the main reason for doing it is to identify dead regions. So let's actually try and define what a dead region is. So a dead region is an area where there's no surviving inner hair cells in the cochlea. And this was first described by Moore back in 2007. So the assumption, of course, is that outer hair cells are the most commonly damaged and therefore the main cause of sensory neural hearing loss. But on occasions, people can also have inner hair cell loss. And when there's inner hair cell loss, this is known as a dead region. We've already demonstrated earlier on in the presentation that audiometry cannot differentiate between outer hair cell and inner hair cell loss. Um, and so therefore, uh, we need to have a test to do that. What's more important is that uh, Moore in his uh, original paper described that amplification of frequencies inside a dead region does not improve speech intelligibility. So what does this mean? Well, it means that actually if we have a person without a hair cell loss and a person with inner hair cell loss, then we need to have two different fitting uh, strategies because one, uh, the ones without a hair cell loss, we will be amplifying the full range of hearing, whereas the, those with inner hair cell loss, we will be needing uh, only amplify the region outside of the dead region. Now you could say, well, dead regions occur so infrequently that it's not such a uh, big deal if we occasionally miss one in patients. But if we look at the research, uh, Pepler et al. did a study which looked at new patients coming into their clinic and they found that 36% of patients actually had a dead region. So actually a third of all patients coming in are going to be needing a different fitting strategy to the one which is typically uh, employed. We really need to take this into account when uh, doing hearing aid fitting assessments. So how do we tell if an audiogram has a dead region? Well, it's pretty straightforward. What we need to do is firstly establish threshold, and we need to do this using a 2 dB step size. So typically what you'd do is you'll measure threshold using conventional pure tone audiometry, and then you would then re-measure the threshold at the frequency which you want to test for a dead region. 
And they're typically uh, more common at, at frequencies where there's a hearing loss of 60 dB or more. But don't be uh, complacent with that term uh, because they can also happen in uh, hearing losses where the uh, where the, the threshold is less than 60 dB. But anyway, so you've chosen the frequency which you want to test for a dead region. You re-establish threshold using a 2 dB step size. And then what we need to do is apply a 10 noise to the ear. So the idea of applying the 10 noise to the ear is that it's going to mask the neighboring inner hair cells so that we can focus on the frequency which we want to test. And the level of the 10 noise which you're going to put in the ear is going to depend on which uh, threshold the patient has. Uh, so if the threshold is less than 60 dB, then you put a 10 noise in at 70 dB. If the threshold is between 60 and 80, then you just take the threshold and then you do 10 dB on top of that threshold to input the 10 noise. And then lastly, if the threshold is eight, uh, larger than 80 dB, then we put the 10 noise in at the maximum level, which is 90. And then simply we establish threshold in the 10 noise. So to make that make a bit more sense, we can do an example. So in this audiogram, we're going to measure the two kilohertz and four kilohertz on the right here to see if there is a dead region. You see two graphs on this screen. Uh, on the top graph is the uh, threshold equalizing noise uh, in the frequency domain. And then the bottom graph, of course, is going to be a two kilohertz pure tone. Both of those sounds are going to go into the right ear. So first thing we need to do is establish the pure tone threshold at 2000 Hertz, which on the previous slide we saw was 65 dB. We're going to reestablish that threshold using a 2 dB step size, which takes that threshold into 64 dB. Then what we're going to do is take uh, 64, add 10 uh, to make uh, 74 dB, and that's the level which we're going to apply the 10 noise into the right ear. Then what we're going to do is then continue to apply pure tones into that right ear. So both the 10 noise and the pure tone going into the same ear and we're going to establish threshold. And in this example, we've established threshold at 78 dB. We can do the same at 4000 Hertz. So again, the threshold, pure tone threshold was 70 dB. We're going to use a 2 dB step size to re-establish threshold and we get 72. We're then going to then decide the 10 noise. So that's going to be 10 dB more than the threshold. So it's going to be 82 dB. And then we're going to remeasure the threshold in the 10 noise. And what we get is a 96 dB threshold. What does that look like on an audiogram? Well, it will look something like this. So at two kilohertz, what you can see is the threshold uh, in, with the red circle. We can then, or the, the AC threshold anyway, with the red circle, we can then see the gray square. The gray square represents the level of the 10 noise, which was introduced into the ear. And then the 10 symbol, which is at 78 dB at two kilohertz, represents the threshold um, of the right ear in 10 noise. And we can do the same with the uh, four kilohertz area too. So, so how do we, use the 10 test to identify if there's a dead region. Well, there's two criteria that the 10 threshold needs to achieve. So the mass threshold, so where it says 10, must be 10 dB or above uh, the level of the 10 noise, which is the gray square. And then secondly, the 10 threshold or the mass threshold is at least 10 dB above the non mass threshold. So let's break those examples down a little bit more detail. What we can see is that at 2000 Hertz, okay, the 10 noise was introduced into the ear at 75 dB. And the threshold in the 10 noise was 78 dB. So immediately what we can see is that the threshold or the threshold, the 10 threshold is not less than 10 dB than the uh, 10 noise. So this means that the dead region is not present. And this is uh, likely to be an outer hair cell loss. The second criteria therefore doesn't matter, uh, but 
it would be the mass threshold is at least 10 dB above the non mass threshold. And we can see that that criteria is actually met. But as the first criteria has not been met, we know that the ted, a dead region is not present. At 4000 Hertz, however, we have a different story. So we have the 10 noise in at 82 dB. And then, so that's the gray square at 4000 Hertz at 82 dB. And then when we measure the 10 threshold or the threshold in the 10 noise, then uh, what we can see is that this 10 symbol is occurring at 96 dB. So that's greater than 10 uh, dB uh, above the 10 noise. And then what we can see is that the threshold originally, the original pure tone threshold was 72, or the, ten, the threshold in the 10 is 10 dB greater than the 72. So it's actually 24 dB greater from 72 to 96. So again, we have a dead region present. So how does this all help us with choosing our hearing aid fitting? Well, as I say, there's two real areas which you can uh, use the information from the 10 test for. And firstly, uh, it can help you choose which bandwidth of hearing aid you're going to choose. We find that hearing aids are now uh, uh, giving us much more information in the high frequencies than they can uh, provide amplification up to 10,000 hertz. Uh, but uh, as Moore suggested uh, in his uh, original paper that uh, we shouldn't really be amplifying the frequencies which are housed inside the dead region because there's a risk uh, that this can cause distortion. And there's been a consensus in the literature that you should amplify up to 1.7 times the edge frequency of the dead region. So what does that mean? Well, if we have a 4000 hertz uh, dead region on the audiogram, then what we can do is we can do 1.7 times 4000, which equals 6800 hertz. And this means that we shouldn't really be applying amplification above this frequency. Therefore, is this person going to benefit from a very wide bandwidth hearing aid? Probably not. Um, so you can use this information to then direct what type of hearing aid you're going to be fitting for this person. Then secondly, you can have a look at frequency compression because you might say, OK, while there's a dead region present, we don't want to apply amplification in this dead region. But instead, what we want to do is we want to take those frequencies and apply them into a healthy area of the cochlea where there's maybe only outer hair cell loss. With frequency compression or frequency transposition, for one, we have to remember that they're two different techniques. We really have to understand how it works. Uh, and what it's actually doing. Because if we go to the literature, there's varied research coming out which says sometimes that frequency compression is actually bad for dead regions, whereas some uh, different uh, techniques which are employing frequency uh, compression or transposition say that it's they should be used in patients with dead regions. So it's really important to know what hearing aid you're choosing, how the frequency compression or transposition works, and is there evidence that it works or is there evidence that it doesn't work? And therefore, should you be fitting it at all? So you can use uh, this information to really help guide the, uh, the type of hearing aid uh, which you're going to be using. And again, whether or not frequency compression or transposition is right for this particular patient. OK, so let's move on to the next test as I'm, I see we're 20 minutes in and we uh, need to get through two more sets of tests. So what we're going to do now is talking about identifying a signal to noise ratio loss. And you can do this in lots of different ways. And the, the test which I've chosen to demonstrate today is the Quicksyn test. And the reason why I've done that is it's just the most common test which we use in English. The nice thing about the uh, interacoustics affinity Callisto and Equinox is that they actually have a speech in noise uh, test module. So if you are uh, in uh, a country which is not using English as the native language, then you can actually build your speech content and your noise content. And you can use this, um, this test to actually identify uh, a patient signal to noise loss. But 
Why do we need to do these types of things? Well, as we sort of talked about at the beginning, really, uh, current testing methods just do not replicate real world situations. And as a consequence of that, uh, we often find that the patients are often complaining that speech and noise is the most difficult situation for them to hear in, yet we're not taking that into account when we're actually uh, making a hearing aid assessment. And perhaps we should be. So how do we measure somebody's ability to hear in noise? Well, there's lots of different ways and paradigms of doing it. Um, I'm just going to present one uh, way to you today, which is effectively how the QuickSyn works. So typically what you need is you need to have uh, some content which the patient's going to listen to. That could be sentences, words or numbers. And we're going to need some noise. So that could be babble noise. It could be pink noise. It could be any kind of uh, noise. And uh, what we are going to do is we're going to pit both the content and the noise into the patient's ear and we're going to uh, measure how much they can hear or how much of the content they correctly hear. Uh, and then we're going to then increase the noise and again measure how much of the content they can hear and then increase the noise again. And typically what you do is you can see how much or the percentage of the content which the patient has got right. And at the same time, once you have that uh, information, you can then compare the performance of how that patient is uh, uh, performing to a normal hearing population. And this can give something called a signal to noise loss calculation. So let's define that a little bit more. So what is SNR loss? Well, SNR loss is defined as the dB increase in signal to noise ratio required by a hearing impaired person to understand speech in noise compared to someone with normal hearing. Uh, with the QuickSyn, uh, Killian has demonstrated this graphically for us. So what we can see on the graph on the horizontal axis is signal to noise ratio and on the, vert uh, on the vertical axis, the percentage of speech material which the patient got right. So what we can see is this is a graph for a normal individual. So what we can see is that when the speech material is played at a fixed intensity, but we change how much noise is in the uh, is played at the same time, it has an effect on how much of the material the patient can correctly identify. So if we start off on the right side of the graph, so signal to noise ratio of 20 dB. So this means that the signal uh, was paid 20 dB louder than the noise and the patient was able to uh, pick up 100% of this uh, signal. Whereas if we take the 5 uh, dB signal to noise level, then what we can see is that the patient actually could only hear about 75% of the uh, information which was being uh, delivered. So that means that the noise was only 5 dB quieter than the speech material. And typically what we do and what happens in the QuickSyn anyway is that we take the 50% uh, marker. And so the normal hearing population, uh, what will happen is they will be able to score 50% of speech material right when the noise is 2 dB quieter than the speech. So what happens when we have a hearing impaired person? Well, of course, their uh, scores are going to be a little bit worse. So in this situation, what we can see is that when the, the signal is, uh, the, well, the noise is 20 dB quieter than the signal, then they still score 100%. But we can see now when the signal or the noise, sorry, the noise is 10 dB quieter than the signal, then we can see that although the normals are scoring 100%, this impaired uh, user is only scoring around about 70%. But the value which we're interested in with the QuickSyn is the 50% value. So we can take 50% of speech uh, measured correctly and we can come down and we can see that this leaves us with around about 8 dB SNR. So uh, what we need to do now is to then subtract the level uh, or subtract 2 dB, which is the SNR of a normal hearing person. Uh, so we do 8 dB minus 2 dB, which is 6 dB. 
and therefore this person the hearing impaired person has a SNR loss of 6 dB the rule is if the SNR loss is low then that's good because they're going to have similar function to or normal hearing uh, individuals whereas if the uh, SNR is high then they're going to have a lot more difficulty hearing in noise than normal hearing peers. Now this is important uh, because there's no way that we can predict the person's signal to noise loss. So if we take a uh, example where we compare signal to noise loss scores with the audiogram then Taylor in 2003 took 100 individuals and he measured their SNR loss and their audiometric average and what we can see is this was the spread of data over those 100 individuals. Uh, what I've done just to highlight uh, and make it a bit easier is I've taken what's classified as a mild signal to noise loss and a severe signal to noise loss and what we can see is that at 40 dB we can see that people uh, actually have uh, some two of the individuals actually had a uh, almost normal SNR loss whereas there's a spattering of uh, people coming from mild to moderate to severe all around the 40 dB area so actually just doing an audiogram you can have a patient which is having very good ability to hear in noise but also very poor ability to hear in noise so again really demonstrating that we need to be doing speech and noise testing the same happens with speech audiometry in quiet so what this study by Wilson and McArdle did in 2005 was to take 387 patients and they presented speech in quiet material at 80 dB and what they found was that of the 387 283 were actually scoring above 80 percent correct uh, when they listened to the speech material at 80 dB which is good which we'd probably expect to uh, see in our clinics also around the world however what was interesting again is if we look at the signal to noise loss in these patients and we indicate on the graph what's a mild signal to noise loss and what's a severe signal to noise loss this region these patients which are uh, scoring above 80 percent have uh, a really widespread of SNR losses so these people are going to be performing much better in noise than what these people are and as a consequence they need to have a different hearing aid fitting strategy and therefore we need to do speech and noise testing to identify that and then to choose our hearing aid features uh, based on that information so what is quicksin well it's just a quick way of accurately measuring a person's signal to noise loss so what we're going to do is we're going to play sentences uh, binaurally or you can play it through a speaker or through the headphones it doesn't really matter uh, as long as uh, you're getting stimulation in both ears and then what we're going to do is we're going to apply in addition to those sentences an adaptive for talk of babble which we're going to uh, start off at a low level and we're going to increase the level in 5 dB steps and we'll go through an example in a second but this is the uh, instructions which we're going to uh, give the patient so imagine that you're having a conversation with a lady at the party or you'll hear both her speech as well as background noise your job is to repeat the sentences which you hear however more people will join the party and make hearing the lady's speech more difficult keep trying to listen to her voice and repeat what you hear okay so I've given you the instructions of what to do for the test and we can actually do a quick sin test now so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play you a sentence and what I want you to do is to repeat that sentence out loud and then we can see uh, how much you uh, could hear and what I want you to do is if you can keep a pen and paper next to you so you can keep a tally of your score you can actually work out your SNR loss at the end of it so what we're going to do is we're going to play the first sentence and I want you to verbally out loud repeat that sentence back 
A white silk jacket goes with any shoes. Okay, so what I heard there was a white silk jacket goes with any shoes. We can see that there's five words highlighted in red. White silk jacket any shoes. So if you could hear each of those five words, then you get five points. If you're going to hear four of those words, then you get four points. Three of those words, three points, etc. So if you heard everything, then you have a score of five. And now what we're going to do is increase the background noise and go again. The child crawled into the dense grass. Okay, so the next uh, sentence was, the child crawled into the dense grass. So again, child crawled into dense grass. If you heard all of those words, then you score five. If you missed one of those words in red, then you need to deduct that from your score. We're going to make the noise a bit louder now. Footprints showed the path he took up the beach. Okay, so that one was footprints showed the path he took up the beach. Let's do the next one. A vent near the edge brought in fresh air. So it's getting a bit more difficult now, but that one was a vent near the edge brought in fresh air. Let's do the next one. It is a band of steel, three inches wide. Okay, so now we're having a lot of difficulty. There's lots of people at this party. And uh, what we heard was it is a band of steel, three inches wide. So band steel, three inches wide. If you scored, if you heard all of those words, then you get five. Uh, and uh, you deduct a point for each one you didn't hear. So the last one we're going to do is really tricky. Uh, I never hear any of this, uh, but uh, if you can, then I'll be really impressed. Here we go. So that one was the weight of the package was seen on the high scale. Okay, what do we get once we finish that list? Well, what we can see on the screen, if I just get my uh, marker out, is that we have all of the content which we uh, played. And what we can see is the score in this example uh, of uh, a patient which we've tested. So we've said that the SNR loss is the find as the dB increase in signal to noise ratio required by a hearing impaired person to understand speech in noise compared with someone with normal hearing. So what we can do is that this person had a total score of 21 uh, words correct out of the 30. And we can see here that the normal score, normal individual score, uh, or normal hearing individual score 25.5. So what we have to do is that we do 25.5 minus the patient score, which is 21, which gives us a SNR loss of 4.5 dB. Then we have to make a decision, well, what does that mean? Well, then we can come up to this graph at the top, and this is going to tell us uh, what those SNR losses mean in terms of hearing aid features. And what we can see is that as the degree of SNR loss increases, then the degree of signal enhancement required from the hearing aid increases. So if you have a very low S SNR score, then it really means that you have you can hear just as well as normal as in noise. But if you have a very high SNR score, then what this means is that you have a really difficulty hearing in uh, background noise. And as a consequence, uh, you're going to need something to assist you. Uh, you probably would need something like a, uh, a microphone or an FM system to help out. And where you are in the middle, then this could influence what type of directional microphone technology you would need to accurately fit the hearing aid to give the person the best chance of hearing in uh, background noise. 
So, as I mentioned, what can we do with this information? Firstly, we can look at directional microphone technology. So, which directional microphone is stra a strategy is best based on the Quixin score? Do we actually need to make a second program with a dedicated directional uh, microphone, which is fixed so that the patient knows that in a noisy situation, they're going to be getting a fixed directionality in the best possible uh, signal coming from directly in front of them. The other thing to look at, of course, now is that there's been a lot of developments with directionality in hearing aids in recent years, where uh, the traditional directional microphone array is being improved and uh, information can be processed a lot more quickly. So what is the consequence of that uh, setting when you uh, have a patient who has a low SNR score and a high SNR score? Uh, so again, um, I don't have all the answers, but it's really to understand what, how the directional microphone strategy is working and how that affects people with certain levels of signal to noise uh, loss. In addition to the directional microphones, are they actually enough? Is the signal to noise loss so great that actually we need to think about additional hardware such as FM microphones or direct microphones or connect microphones to uh, assist them in more difficult listening situations? And then we come on to our last test, which is identifying acceptance with the acceptable noise level test. So we have always been uh, taught in audiology that, of course, the main aim of the game with hearing aid fittings is to ensure that uh, we provide good speech uh, uh, signal and improve speech intelligibility and understanding for people with uh, a hearing loss. But uh, noise is important, too, and we shouldn't beget noise when actually uh, making or choosing our hearing aids. Because if we look at the literature again, the Kochkin Mark Track studies consistently show us that many reasons for patients not wearing a hearing aid is because they complain about the background noise. And this study uh, by uh, uh, Nablik uh, in 1991. Uh, showed us uh, an individual's willingness to listen but listen in background noise may be more indicative of hearing aid use than actual speech understanding. So what they really found was that actually if there's just an, a discomfort uh, listening in background noise, even if they could hear well, um, then they're just not going to wear the hearing aid. So we really need to take into account uh, the background noise uh, and the put each in individuals patients tolerance to background noise when selecting uh, hearing aid features. And the acceptable noise level test is exactly a test to do this. So it's a test to show how much noise the patient is able to tolerate while listening to a, a target or a, a signal. So what we're going to do is we're going to play a, uh, a passage uh, through a loudspeaker uh, and what we're going to do is uh, we're going to listen or identify the person's most comfortable uh, levels whilst listening to this passage of speech. Then what we're going to do is once we've measured their most comfortable levels we're going to then apply background noise and we're going to increase the background noise until the patient finds that the background noise level is too high and not tolerable and uh, then what we can do then is take those two uh, levels and we can uh, subtract them and this will create or calculate the acceptable noise level and uh, acceptable noise level has been shown to be a good predictor of how well patients are going to succeed with hearing aids. So what we have is this is uh, an example of how it works. So we have a speech signal uh, along here. So this is a passage of speech, which is just going to be continually playing. And then the job of the uh, audiologist is to just adjust that speech uh, passage until the patient finds that it's at a comfortable level. Once we've identified that comfortable level in this example, it was 65 dB. We're going to set that as the patient's most comfortable level. Then what we're going to do is then whilst keeping that passage of speech playing, we're going to introduce noise into the background 
and what we're going to see is could the patient tolerate more noise and then in this example the noise is quite low so the patient says yes I can tolerate this um, so we need to increase the noise we do that and the noise is too loud so this patient says no this is too invasive I am um, this I don't like this I don't tolerate this level of noise so then we reduce the noise to a, a quieter level and then we keep doing this until the patient finds that the level of noise is acceptable to listen to uh, and this accepts or creates the background noise level what we can then do is do the MCL minus the background noise level so that's 65 in this example minus 55 which gives an acceptable noise level of 10 if we then look at the interpretation of this then what we can see is that ANL scores of less than eight is really shows good prognosis for regular use and acceptance of hearing aids whereas an acceptable noise level of greater than 12 with the prognosis uh, for this patient was really that at risk for reduced utilization of hearing aids uh, because they find background noise so uh, offensive to them and therefore uh, these patients will require counseling but also we can see here noise reduction technologies so this is how this technology can actually relate to sorry this is how this uh, test can relate to choosing the technology which you're going to apply to the hearing aid or the hearing aid feature so again with acceptable noise levels then what we should be doing is then taking this information and then looking at well what is the acceptable noise level score what hearing aid am I going to be fitting the patient and then looking at how does this hearing aid deal with noise reduction do I have a very high acceptable noise level and therefore I need to have more sophisticated uh, noise reduction algorithms or uh, how aggressively should I apply the noise reduction algorithm or do I need to apply more uh, or less sensitive noise reduction depending on the ANL score. Directionality will also come into play. Directionality and uh, noise reduction are now often working together. So again, uh, what is the best microphone strategy to keep uh, background noise at a minimum? And if we want to really enhance the signal by and then therefore reduce the background noise, then uh, FM systems and direct microphones can also help. So we actually have a, a really useful set of tests which can give us good insight in how we should be fitting our hearing aids. The last thing I'm going to show you before I wrap up is that you can actually uh, take the QuickSyn score and the acceptable noise level score and apply them on something called a red flag matrix. So what we can see on the horizontal axis is the QuickSyn score and on the vertical axis we can see the acceptable noise level score. And the patient will either fall into one of four quadrants. So if the patient falls into this quadrant they have a low QuickSyn score which means they can hear well in background noise and a low acceptable noise level score which means they tolerate background noise well and these guides have a good prognosis for hearing aids if they fall into this quadrant then they have a low quicksyn score so they can hear well in background noise but they have a low tolerance to noise itself so they're going to be finding their hearing aids more annoying so in these uh, patients you're really wanting to look at noise reduction uh, so on uh, yeah noise reduction strategies uh, to to improve their hearing aid fittings and maybe applying a more aggressive noise reduction in this example or this quadrant what we can see is they have a high quicksyn score so they're not hearing very well in background noise but they can tolerate background noise well so these guys are having an intelligibility risk so again directional microphones and uh, signal enhancing technologies is going to help those uh, in particular down here and then in this example this is the most unfortunate patients because they have difficulty hearing in background noise and they have a low tolerance to background noise uh, in general so they'll find that their hearing aids aren't uh, providing them with the most intelligibility and that they are uh, also could be a risk of uh, annoyance through too much uh, background noise 
So these guys really need a lot of counseling, but also you can influence your hearing aid fitting uh, selection uh, by choosing a good uh, hearing aid technology with good noise reduction algorithms with a good directionality, for instance. So that really comes to the end of the presentation. And really what I want to do is to uh, highlight that a, a comprehensive hearing aid assessment should look beyond the audiogram. And hopefully you've seen today that there's good reason to do that. We've got the free tests which I've gone through. There are other tests which you can use, but the threshold equalizing noise test, the speech and noise test, and this, this example is the QuickSyn, and the acceptable noise level test. And really we can use this to help us identify bandwidth, frequency compression, signal enhancing technologies, as well as noise reduction technologies. So I hope that has all made sense for you. Uh, if you do have any questions, then I'm more than happy to answer them now. Uh, if uh, you don't want to answer a question in this or ask a question in this environment, then feel free to send an email to uh, academy at interacoustics.com uh, where um, we can actually uh, have a private conversation about what we've uh, learned today. So uh, Dave has mentioned I need a little more clarification on the 10 noise spectrum. I've always assumed the noise spectrum was more like a band that was more to either side of the test frequency. Well if we go back to the uh, 10 test example here we are. So this is the 10 noise here. So actually the 10 noise spectrum actually is a, it's a broadband stimulus. So it's actually designed to stimulate the entire cochlea all the way up to 10,000 hertz. So actually uh, what it will do is uh, when you introduce a threshold, the 10 noise in it, say example, this example, which was 82 dB, then whatever frequency you're going to test in the cochlea, it will actually raise its frequency up and to 82 dB and this will um, this will uh, ensure that uh, you can actually then uh, identify the dead region so uh, it's, it's the, 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 the 10 noise doesn't change per each frequency it will actually only uh, it's the same noise uh, for each frequency Okay, and uh, Barbara, with the 10 test, wouldn't you assume the effective masking component of the 10 noise will artifactually raise the threshold for everyone, normal and abnormal? Absolutely. So uh, that's why, uh, so whatever you put the 10 noise in, then yes, you are going to be causing a, a, a rise in threshold. The difference is, is that if you are a normal person or a normal hearing person, then uh, what will happen is when you re-establish threshold, your new threshold will be only, it will be less than 10 dB, uh, 10 dB difference from the 10 noise. Whereas if the 10 noise is, uh, if the threshold is greater than 10 dB over the, uh, the noise, then you're going to be identifying that dead region. But you're right, it will be raising the threshold for everyone. Okay, well, again, thank you very much for tuning in. The uh, webinar will be available on the Intro Acoustics Academy website. Uh, it will be uh, hopefully up within the next two weeks. Uh, and uh, I will send an email round when uh, everyone's got, uh, when, once that's up for everybody to enjoy. So all that's left to say is uh, thank you for listening and uh, thank you very much and goodbye.